We invite you to spend 30 crazy minutes with the unpredictable Ken Dodd, who's here to prove it's great to be young. <laughs> I would like to say how tickled I am. <laughs> how tickled I am at the kickoff. Yes. Have you ever been tickled at the kickoff, Mrs? You shouldn't play rugby. <laughs> They're always having a try. By Joe. <laughs> By Joe, I'm full of bands tonight. I've had budgie seed for me tea. <clears throat> In this show, we're going to do all sorts of experiments. I'm always experimenting. I once put sunglasses on a hen. It was three weeks trying to hatch out a black pudding. <laughs> <laughs> you holy mackerel there, Andy. We... <laughs> we want to bring you... We want to bring you the theatre atmosphere. All the people listening at home. Pretend you're at the music hall. Chuck orange peel at one another. <laughs> All you children, pretend you're in the balcony. Climb on the top of the sideboard and drop nuts on your granddad's head. <laughs> That's it. I tell you what, let's have some community singing. We'll sing the songs we all like singing in the bath. Come on, everybody take your clothes off and we'll get cracking. <laughs> this will be a radio show to end all radio shows. When you're doing a show like this, you see, you have to find something to amuse everybody. Now, the teenagers at the moment are having a lot of fun out of a song all about a fellow who crashes his car. And as he sits up in the wreckage, trying to open the door with one hand and remove the windscreen wiper out of his ear all with the other... <laughs> He's singing, tell Laura I love her. <laughs> Little does he know, but it was Laura who disconnected the brakes. <laughs> she hated the sight of him. <laughs> it's amazing, really, the things that amuse people. I mean, braces make some people laugh. Do braces make you laugh, missus? Do they? Well, why do you wear them? <laughs> and have you ever thought what amuses the over-80s? I've been watching my granny very closely, and I found out what it is that tickled her. <laughs> my granddad. <laughs> Yes. You've got to let yourself go. Inside, you're all coiled up like a spring. I'll talk to you, sir. You look as though something snapped. <laughs> it has, too. What unusual underpants. <laughs> look at the way I live. Bed, work, bed, work, work, bed. Mind you, it's a good place to work. Bed. <laughs> See, I have to rest my brain. People often say, people often say, what is it about Ken Dodd that makes him different? The answer's easy. My brain. That's it, in a nutshell. <laughs> no, no, no. A fella came on our radio and he said that a good way to relax was to get buffed with the light out. The next night I tried it. I put the light out, climbed into the bath and put my foot in my granddad's mouth. <laughs> oh, these Turkish baths, by Jove, they're popular places. You go into like a big room full of steam and all the men are sitting around in their benches. Well, they're very popular. My auntie Nelly went four times last week. <laughs> a lady... <laughs> A lady wrote to me the other day with a long nose. She'd lost her pen, and this... <laughs> this letter came from a lady who lives in Torquay, and she says that my voice sends her. The letter's postmarked Alaska, and... <laughs> she said that my voice reminds her of her childhood. She had a wicked uncle, and I'm... I'm very fortunate tonight in having the assistance of the NDO as the nude dance orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we'd got Ivy Benson. Anyway, come on. <laughs> this song is called Give Us a Kiss. Now yesterday upon the bus I couldn't pay me fare. I went and told the clippy and she gave me such a stir. I really thought that she was going to hit me on the head. But she went and punched me ticket and she said... Give us a kiss. You're rather naughty. Give us a kiss. And please be kind. Go on, give us a kiss. <laughs> and I'll forgive you. I'll give us a kiss. And never mind. 
The other day I parked my car for half an hour or more. I saw a lady policeman standing there beside the door. She said, now it's against the law to park here, you can see. Then she put her notebook back and said to me, Give us a kiss. You're rather naughty. Give us a kiss. And please be kind. Go on, give us a kiss. And I'll forgive you. Oh, give us a kiss. And never mind. One day upon my bicycle, it really made me groan. I bumped into a lady who weighed over 20 stone. We fell down on the floor, and though my heart was filled with dread, she sat there on me tummy and she said, Give us a kiss! You're on the naughty. Give us a kiss! And please be kind. Give us a kiss! And I'll forgive you. Or give us a kiss. sitting comfortably. Good, then we'll begin because we're going to hear a tale from the Doddy book. And if you're very quiet, we can join three happy children as they listen to a bedtime story from Uncle Ken. Shh. Oh, 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 Put down that tomahawk. Dad said you mustn't scalp Uncle Ken. I was only showing him what the Mohicans did on the telly. If you don't let go of my hair, you'll be the last of the Mohicans. <laughs> I'm sorry, Uncle Ken. All right, but just watch it. Just watch it, watch it, watch it. Or little sitting bull will have to spend the rest of the night lying on his tum-tum. <laughs> Uncle Ken? Yes, Timmy? Can an earwig hurt you? A little earwig? Of course not. Oh, that's good, because our bird at one. What? I did not. I saw you. It was on your lettuce at tea time. Well, why didn't you tell him when you saw it, Timmy? Mummy says I mustn't talk with my mouth full. And by the time I'd swallowed, so had Bert. I don't believe you. You're just trying to upset Bert. Well, it's worked. <laughs> <laughs> Look at his mug. Little red skin, now pale face. <laughs> anyway, keep quiet, the three of you, if you want to hear a nice little story. All right, we'll be quiet. Yes, tell us a nice story. OK, but no daft questions, Bert. Now, once upon a time, and don't ask me what time it was, because I don't know, once upon a time... When you watch it, stop. When we watch it. <laughs> Bertram, I'll put your clock back in a minute. <laughs> now listen to the story. Once upon many years ago, when knights fought dragons to rescue dames called damsels, there lived a famous wizard named Jack Sorcerer. He was the greatest magician in the land. He could make thunder and lightning bring rain, and he controlled the wind. Control the wind? Yes, he didn't suffer from it. <laughs> now, Jack had a little son called Sammy, who he hoped would be another great wizard. But unfortunately, Sammy was a bit of a bonehead, like you, Bert. <laughs> Jack Sorcerer was worried, because by now, he was a very old man. Like you, Uncle. <laughs> All right, so Sammy wasn't any good at magic, Uncle? No. Three times little Sammy Sorcerer failed his magic 11 plus, And his father was getting desperate. You see, Sammy was all right with little spells, like changing the teacher's cane into a worm or filling his mortarboard with custard. But with big things like turning a toad into a prince, something always went wrong. And it was very awkward when a handsome prince sang to his princess, You are my uh, uh, delight. <laughs> Oh, isn't it sad, Timmy? Yes. Makes me want to cry. Well, I think it's a lot of... Uh, here, here, here. That'll do. <laughs> One night, little Sammy got an idea from a book. He was lying on his bed of nails... And he got the point. I... <laughs> yes. Something got through to him. In the end. 
And that's where my shoe will get you in a minute, Timmy. Never mind him, Uncle. What was the idea Sammy Sorcerer got? Well, he was lying in bed reading the story of Pinocchio. Remember, I told you about him before. Oh, yes. The little wooden doll who became a real boy. And he had a sort of guardian called Jiminy Cricket. Yes, that's it. Jiminy Cricket was his conscience. What's a conscience? Well, Timmy, when you do anything naughty, there's something that tells you it's wrong, isn't there? Oh, yes. Well, that's your conscience. No, that's my dad. <laughs> All right. Now, you know how Pinocchio and a lot of other boys were turned into donkeys? Yes. Well, when little Sammy Sorcerer read about that, he decided that he would rescue them. He would use his magic to turn the donkeys back into boys. Ooh, smashy! So Sammy made a magic sign, and there was a blue flash, and he woke up in the world of bedtime stories, in Doddyland, where Pinocchio lived. You what? You what? <laughs> what sort of talk's that? You what? You get more like Richard Dimbleby every day. <laughs> on with the story, Uncle. Right. Well, little Sammy wandered through Doddyland until he saw the marzipan trees and the lollipop bushes, and sure enough, he found a crowd of donkeys. So, grabbing a big stick of peppermint rock that was growing beside a chocolate lake, Sammy herded the donkeys into a big field. He got out his magic box and started to cast a spell. He lit a fire with feathers from the tail of a black rooster, and he made a wizard's brew from bat's wings and goose pimples, with one for the pot. <laughs> and while he hopped on his head, he chanted, The leg of a frog, a mole with no toes, all the steam's going up me nose. <laughs> but it was no use. He just couldn't turn the donkeys back into Pinocchio and the other boys. Aww. And just then, a little boy came up to Sammy, and he asked him what he was doing. So Sammy told him, and he said, it's no use. I'm a failure. And big tears plopped from his eyes. But the boy just laughed and laughed, and he said, no wonder your magic won't work. And Sammy said, what do you mean? The boy said, well, I'm Pinocchio. Those are real donkeys. <laughs> Oh, Uncle, poor little Sammy. No, he was all right, because Pinocchio told him what to do. Somebody should tell you what to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough. Just be careful. Remember, as Pinocchio found out, naughty boys grew up to be donkeys. So just pass me a carrot, and I'll tell you <laughs> Pinocchio's advice. He said, Sammy, remember what Jiminy Cricket told me? When you're in trouble, don't cry, just... Give a little whistle. When you get in trouble And you don't know right from wrong Give a little whistle Give a little whistle When you meet temptation And the urge is very strong Give a little whistle Give a little whistle Not just a little squeak Pucker up and blow And if your whistle's weak Yell Jiminy Cricket Take the straight and narrow path And if you start to slide Give a little whistle Give a little whistle and always let your conscience be your guide. Okay, now let's all try it together. You ready? When you get in trouble and you don't know right from wrong, give a little whistle. Give a little whistle. Give a little whistle. When you meet temptation and the urge is very strong, give a little whistle. That's it. Give a little whistle. That's just a wolf whistle. <laughs> Not just a little squeak. Come on now. Pucker up and blow. And if your whistle's weak, yell. Jiminy Jim Cricket. Cricket. That's it. Just take the straight and narrow path. And if you start to slide, give a little whistle. Give a little whistle. And always let your conscience be your 
guide. That's it. You made it. <laughs> Each week in the show, Professor Ken Dodd will reveal some of the mysteries of history. Professor Dodd is, of course, very well known in Liverpool today as a much-travelled reader of gas meters. <laughs> She's right, Mrs. One of the greatest inventions in history was the gramophone, and the man who thought it up was an American, Thomas Edison. But who was the first man in England to realize the possibilities of the gramophone? Who was the first man to get the needle when his pickup wouldn't play? <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you, he was a small-time theatrical agent called Idris Thomas Vernon, the first man to make a fortune with the initials ITV. <laughs> Tommy had got hold of a replica of Edison's gramophone, and he'd made a number of circular discs out of wax. And, but when he looked at them, he said, these records will never make any money as they are, but they'll make a mint with a hole. Ha <laughs> ha! <laughs> and straight away, Tommy started his search for Britain's very first recording star, with the help of his recording engineer, Percy, his 75-year-old apprentice. <laughs> Percy, for the last time, I am not making a record of your performing parrot. Oh, mean old doddy, stingy old doddy. And Percy, if that parrot doesn't stop answering back, he'll get a kick in the seed pot. <laughs> Look, Gaffer, won't you let him make just one record? I'll get him to do his recitation. Go on, say your little piece, Ferdinand. Right, oh. <laughs> there was a young parrot called Polly who wanted to do something jolly. So she flew off to crew with an old cockatoo. Hey, here, you can't do that. <laughs> you can't do that one. No, no, no. Not that one. The one you recite for the vicar. Look, Percy, stop walking about with that parrot on your shoulder. You look like Long John Silver. I can't look like him, Gaffer. He walked with a limp. Well, come here while I kick your shins. <laughs> look, that parrot's no good for making records. Well, when he were on the stage, it were a big hit. Yes, especially the time you were on the bill with that striptease dancer. The one who wore the homing pigeons. <laughs> that poor girl. She had the shock of her life one night when one of her pigeons landed on her shoulders and said, Hello, chubby chops. <laughs> <laughs> well, go on. Let him make a record. Uh, is this the room where you're making trial recordings? Yes. Who are you? Uh, Roger Wainwright, protein actor. <laughs> Friends, Romans, countrymen. <laughs> Lend me your ears. <laughs> I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. <laughs> the evil that... Who wrote your script? Wrote my script. Yes, wrote your script. <laughs> this was written by William Shakespeare. Well, I should get rid of him. That stuff will never get laughs. Now, look, I want singing stars for my records. Do you know any of the latest pop songs? Cherry ripe, cherry ripe, ripe cry. All the fair ones come and go. Cherry ripe, cherry ripe, cherry ripe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Roberto Cardinelli. <laughs> What's wrong with it? I think your cherries have gone off. <laughs> well, really, sir. Percy, show Conway Twitty out. Uh, this, this is insufferable. I protest. Look, Roger, the best thing you can do with that voice is to take up sword swallowing. Good morning. Oh, very well. But really, this is disgraceful. Percy, don't let any more people in for auditions. I'm much too busy today. Much too busy at all. Hello there, handsome. In fact, I'm so busy, I... Uh, sir, well, what a bit of luck. I've got nothing on. I understand you're looking for new recording stars. Yes, gorgeous, and I'll give you a three-year contract. Sign here. But you haven't found out what I can do yet. I will in a minute, Percy. <laughs> Blindfold the parrot. <laughs> now then... Uh... 
Now then, uh, Miss... Uh... Brightwell. Joy Brightwell. To my friends, I'm Joy. I'll bet you are. <laughs> so you want to make records? Yes, for years I've searched for success in show business, but I've just been running around in circles. Well, come and sit on my knee and then you'll be on the last lap. <laughs> Well, thank you. Now, listen, Joy, you and I ought to really get together. Come on, give us a kiss. Oh, but Mr. Vernon... Oh, Tommy, to you. Come on, give us a kiss. You mean you'll help me to become a star and make lots of money? Yes, come on, give us a kiss. Oh, I see. And, and what did you have in mind? Snogging. Give us a kiss. <laughs> no, I mean, how much money will you pay me? A hundred, a hundred pounds a week. Give us a kiss. But I can't kiss you. My boyfriend wouldn't like it. Boyfriend? Yes, Billingsgate Butch, the all-in wrestler. He'd go mad if he knew what was going on. Well, he doesn't know what we're doing. Here. What's going on? Oh, it's Butch. Oh, Mr. Vernon, what are you going to do? Faint. <laughs> Here, what's the idea, mate? My girlfriend on your knee. Well, well, you see, we, 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 we were working up a ventriloquist act. Uh, Joy, say, Greg and Gutter. Hello, Tommy. How are you? <laughs> Why, you little worm, I'll tie your legs in a knot. You what? If you tie my legs in a knot, do you know what I'll do? What? I'll fall off my bike. <laughs> Oh, it's all right, Butch. I'm going to make records for Mr. Vernon. Good. You are not. Oh, but she is, Gaffy. She's made one already. Listen, everybody. Me first gramophone record. You mean you'll help me to become a star and make lots of money? Yes, give us a kiss. I see. And what did you have in mind? Snogging. Give us a kiss. No, I mean, how much money will you pay? A hundred pounds a week. Come on, give us a kiss. A kiss, a kiss, a kiss, a kiss, a kiss, a kiss. He wants a, a kiss. lot of kisses, don't he? <laughs> I'll teach you to keep your hands off of my girl. Here, try these for size. <clears throat> oh, 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 he struck me, Percy. And it's no joke being struck in the Percy. <laughs> Percy, fancy putting that record on the gramophone. I ought to stick your head up the horn. Well, I'm sorry, Gaffer, but it was your own fault for getting friendly with it. Oh, I suppose you're right. I should have remembered my dad's advice. Why, what did he say? He always said that when it comes to other men's women, a bird in the hand gets you two in the mush. <laughs> Out where Peter Goodright, Leonard Williams, Carol Gardner, Jimmy Goldie, the Littlewood Songsters, and myself, Judith Chalmers. Bernard Herman conducted the BBC Northern Dance Orchestra. The show was written by James Casey, Frank Roscoe, and Eddie Braben, and produced in the north of England by James Casey. We hope you'll be with us next week when once again we'll all be saying. the Springfields, Judith Chalmers, that's me, and of course, Ken Dodd. Oh! <laughs> oh! It wasn't me, officer. It was Richard Dimbleby. <laughs> it's the Ken Dodd Show. Go away! Well, oh, up there, Dan, Warren and Doris. Oh, hell, Bob. Never mind, Bob. Ken Dodd's on. 
And you know, Ida, this pain I got when I tried to lift that motorbike upstairs. <laughs> that's it, that's the one. That's the one. Well, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to say how highly honoured I am to have been chosen by the BBC to take part in this programme, which celebrates the 125th anniversary of the birth of Frankenstein. <laughs> Many happy returns of the day! Pull that man's beard off and shove it down his ear hole. <laughs> and here are just a few of the magnificent prizes that can be won here. A year's supply of fluff, one cripping set, a granddad cosy, a fur line thingy, a mechanical cabbage, a dwarf remover, and tonight's star prize, and an unmentionable object. <laughs> Can we have the first contestant, please? I... Your name is? We, John Ellery, much loved and respected Scottish actor of many years standing. Do you mind if I lean on you, son? No, get off. <laughs> and you have chosen to answer questions on? European culture. European culture, right. Listen to these three sounds. <laughs> <coughs> Now, which was it? A, B, or number six? The one in the middle. Correct. I'll give you a tuppence eight and a broken bottle for the key. I'll open your own box. Are you sure? I say I'll open your own box. Very well. We'll open the box. Oh, help, 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 help! Pity. It was a lovely kilt, too. Now, here is the weather report for the eastern half of the country. <laughs> Unscattered chars. <laughs> With ground frost at night. Well, what do you know? Do you know that wives in Liechtenstein for years wore costume jewellery representing their family's entire wealth? And it wasn't unusual to see some women walking about wearing only a tuppence apenny stamp. Well, what do you know? <laughs> Do you know that in Dundee it's considered unlucky to walk under a Scotsman's kilt? <laughs> well, what do you know? <laughs> Here is a very unusual sound recording. That was hair growing. <laughs> that was a man going bald. <laughs> I don't know. What do we do next? Oh, I know. Gardeners, why not try turning the garden over this way? Prices for farmers. You should be able to get a good farmer for about 37 and 6 today. <laughs> I wonder what people really do listen to on the radio. There's only one way to find out. I'll go out into the street and I'll ask them. Ah, here we are. Oxford Street Road. Now, I've got my microphone. Who shall I ask first? I'll ask this city gentleman in the pinstripe bowler. Excuse me, sir. Uh, those mints for the hoe. I never touch the beastly things. Have a jelly, baby. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Oh, here's a lady. Here's a lady just coming out of the hairdressers. I'll ask her. Excuse me, madam. Yes. I... Oh, um... I wonder if you'd mind telling me the sort of programmes you listen to on the radio. Certainly. Housewife's Choice. Woman's Hour. The Dales. I'm very fond of the radio. I hardly ever go out. I'm not surprised. <laughs> Thank you, madam. My husband left me, Yes, you know. yes, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Yes, yes, yes. Henry was a strange man. <laughs> left me to look after our little daughter. Didn't he, Naomi? Yes, mummy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, madam, but you'll have to excuse me. I'm, I'm going to have a word with this little ditty old man over here. Good afternoon, sir. I'm pleased to meet you, Wilfred. No, I'm... I'm not Wilfred Pop. I'm 89, Wilfred. And you still want to have a go. Listen. <laughs> Pop, I'm not Wilfred. You've got it wrong. Have I got a song? Yes, Wilfred. Little Dolly Day. No, okay, Dad. Thanks, Dad. Yes. Thanks. Okay, Dad. You won the seven and six. Here you oh, are. Oh, thank you very much. Cheerio, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> you crafty old pensioner. There he goes, off for another spot of homely fun in some woman's house. <laughs> He's a fellow selling newspapers. I'll ask him. All the ladies' edition, all the football uh, excuse me. the paper. Uh, excuse, excuse me, which programmes do you like on the radio? I'm fond of family favourites on a Sunday. Fond of family favourites on a Sunday. How about any questions on a Friday? Any questions on a Friday? Have you come here to be insulting? Have you come here to be insulting? I only asked a civil question. I only asked a civil question. Oh, Peter, a clat around the hero. Oh, Peter, a clat around the hero. No, listen, no. Mr. Thompson, I'm from the BBC. 
Uh, oh, I see. Well, uh, I can only let you have a tenner then, mate. Oh, thank you very much. Who shall I ask next about what they like to hear on the radio? I know. I'll ask this window cleaner at the top of his ladder. I'll ask him. Hey, are you there? You what? I'm from the BBC. You what? I'm from the BBC. You what? I'm from the BBC. You what? And oh, blimey, if I had his address, I could write to him. <laughs> 87 Halibut Terrace. <laughs> Clever fellow, eh? Don't shake that ladder. You could hear me all the time, couldn't you? Stop shaking that ladder. <laughs> <laughs> right in the canal. I can't swim. You know what? <laughs> to hear on the wireless. Top of the form and listen with Muller. Who's your favourite singing group? The Spurs. The Spurs. The Springfields. you do-it-yourself enthusiasts. Now, this is your old friend, Andy Mann. Now, I'll not keep you a minute. I'm just boxing the wife in. Now, there we are. <laughs> I'll let her out at tea time. Now then, how did you go on with last week's job? A great many of you have written to me saying that I must have given the wrong instructions about the amount of timber needed for the job. Many of you couldn't get the pipe rack into the house. <laughs> well, I'm very sorry about that because I forgot to mention that we weren't making a pipe rack, we were building a hen pen. <laughs> Still, not to worry, it should prove very useful to those of you who keep hens that smoke. <laughs> this week we're going to make a serving hatch. And this little job shouldn't cost us any more than 15 shillings. We'll need 12 bags of cement, 50 bricks, and a hundredweight of sand. Now, mix the cement in your old trousers. It's a bit uncomfortable, but the temperature is good for the cement. We'll also need about three pounds of six-inch nails, or failing that, six pounds of three-inch nails. Now, let's see what we've got in our little toolboxes. Or is it box I? <laughs> Yes. Let's see what's in the toolbox. I see. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Yes. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Nothing. <laughs> the sides of the serving hatch will have to be wood lined, and I suggest Ickery. Ickery is your best bet every time because it's a very reliable wood, is Ickery. They use it a lot for making clocks. <laughs> anyway, that's what I'm going to use now. Well, what I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm slotting A into the B section and making the joint good with a... Ooh! With a B nail. <laughs> if you've got dry rot, you'd best do this job sitting down. Yes, now it's coming along nicely. You see, on a job like this, good tools are half the battle. Half the battle, that's what good tools are. The battle's half over if you've got good tools because they're half the battle. It's quite a simple job to put the head back onto the hammer. <laughs> Having done that, we should find out that the glue is boiling nicely and almost ready. Now, I'll test it. <laughs> yes, it's perfect. Now, we've come now to the tricky part of the job, and that is knocking out the bricks from the wall to put in the serving hatch. Now, I'm only taking 25 bricks out of this job, you see. Here we are. Now, you see, it's quite simple. <laughs> Barry Bucknell. <laughs> here we are. Just one more brick to come out, and here we go. I'll show you how to build a new house. It'll only cost about £5,000. First of all, we need half an acre of land, two lorries loaded... <laughs> Music 
lovers will be delighted to hear that we have with us in the studio Mr. Kenneth Arthur Dart, well-known music critic and distinguished conductor of the 75 bus. Mr. Dart. <laughs> Jude, you thank us. I mean, thank you, Judith. <laughs> First, a roundup of news from the world of pop music and a shock for fans. Flora Robson has left the Vernons girls. <laughs> she told me in her dressing room at the Singlet Club last night, I can't go on. I feel funny all over. <laughs> The annual Screen Award for the Best Film Music of the Year has been won by Paddy Flaherty for his beautiful shillelagh theme from that wonderful Irish film, Sodom and Begorra. <laughs> now, Maestro Dodd presents the all-time hit parade, the greatest songs in the world, songs that will live forever. Yes, unforgettable songs like, uh, um, 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 what's he called? Get a move on, we haven't got all flaming nights. Oh, yes, lovely songs like Get a move on, we haven't got all flaming nights. <laughs> and they, oh, I see what you mean, yes. <laughs> <clears throat> Surely everyone remembers that delightful song written some years ago and called, quite simply, Till. <laughs> Do you remember this next old favourite, Mistakes? <laughs> Now we come to one of my own favourites, a very romantic song called A Kiss in the Dark. Here, what's the game? I'm sorry, officer. <laughs> and this next one, an evergreen from Noel Card. Oh, look at that. Of course, a room with a view. <laughs> Excuse me, Ken, can I interrupt? I know a song which I think will go into the all-time hit parade. I heard a fellow singing it on a record the other day. Do you know, I can't for the life of me remember his name for the moment. It says here. <laughs> but the song was called Remember I Love You. <laughs> <laughs> listening to me now are thinking about your summer holidays. I'll bet the thousands of people when they heard me in this show said, let's go away somewhere. <laughs> so, for anyone who hasn't made their mind up yet about where they're going, I've got a holiday guidebook here and I'll read you some of the smashing places you can visit. <clears throat> I mean, how does this sound? 14 days coach tour of the Yorkshire Tyrrell. How's that? <laughs> Eight glorious days basking on the sun-drenched shores of the Costa Mersey. <laughs> Pony trekking through the gently wooded slopes of Stepney. <laughs> where one can pause and still see the age-old crafts being pursued, in spite of police warnings. <laughs> Here's an unusual holiday. Yachting on the M1. <laughs> this is the time of the year when all the hotel keepers and boarding house people are getting ready for the holiday makers. They're all fixing their price lists and singing, let's twist again, like we did last summer. <laughs> and a lot of people will be going to Wales this year, to places like Clan Flecky Nick Knock Knack Nick Nicky Knock Knack Nick. Aberith Gur Flecken Go Go Goch. <laughs> the Isle of Man's a nice place. <laughs> oh, here's one. This sounds good up in Scotland. The Beacon Hotel. Mm, the Beacon Hotel. With a wonderful vista of the wild Scottish coastline. Well, that sounds good. Whilst at the Beacon Hotel, you will no doubt want to pay a visit. The <laughs> turn over. Oh, I see, yeah. Turn over to our wonderful continental bar. There is dancing every night and a well-sprung settee in the games room. <laughs> For further details, telephone Invercocky Leaky 22. General Manager, Mr. J. Lorry. By Jove, I like the sound of that. I'll give them a ring now. <clears throat> I'll ask the operator to get the number for me. They're very helpful these days. Hello, operator. Hello, you dear subscriber. How do you do you do? Is there some little number that I can get for you? Yes, there is, Miss Callus. <laughs> Have you got in for Cocky Leaky, too, too? How dare you? No, it's in Scotland. Oh. <laughs> Hold the line, please. 
Uh, go ahead, you're through now. Hello, is that Invercocky Leaky? No, this is Leaky Invercocky. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello, operator. Uh, hello, you dare subscribe on. Yes, right, thank you. Right, thank you, love. We've had that bit. Now, <laughs> I wanted Invercocky Leaky, and you've given me Leaky, in leaky Invercocky. Oh, I'm so sorry. They all sound the same to me, you know. <laughs> no, they didn't. They're all Invers and Leakies and Cockies and... Uh, go ahead now, please. Go ahead, go ahead. Hello? Oh, my bonny wee laddie. John Laurie speaking from the Beacon Hotel. Oh, well, I didn't think it was the Edmundo Ross Club. <laughs> Listen, Taffy, I'd like to stay at your hotel. Certainly. What's the name, please? The Beacon Hotel. I know that one. <laughs> What's your name? Ken Dodd speaking. Oh, aye. How do you spell that? S-P-E-A-K-I-N-G speaking. <laughs> hey, hey, I see you have a sense of humour, man. <laughs> You'll need it when you see this place. Oh. <laughs> Beg your pardon? I said we'll need somebody like you in this place. Oh. How soon can he come? Huh? Well, let me see. It's half past eleven here in the morning. That means it's two o'clock in the afternoon in Scotland. If I leave now, I should be there half an hour ago. How will that do you? Oh, fine, 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 fine. It's a bra brecht midnight nacht the nest. Pardon? I said it's a bra brecht midnight nacht the nest. Oh, well, I'm not coming if it's foggy. <laughs> You'll be wanting full board. Yes, please. Right. I'll away and buy a bed. Pardon? I said I'll go and buy some bread for your supper. <laughs> it isn't for myself, you understand. I'll be waiting to be cheap at the lock. Which lock? Oh, no, never mind. I know the answer to that one. All right, I'll, uh, I'll see you later. Uh -huh. I'm looking forward to meeting you, my bonny wee laddie. I love that Bolton accent. Right. <laughs> How am I going to get there? That's the point. I know. I'll hop onto these two empty coconut shells and head for the border. Hi ho, Silva! <laughs> ah, here we are, right on the border. By Joe, this should be interesting. There's a man from the Scottish Tourist Board welcoming visitors to Scotland, and there's a man from the English Tourist Board welcoming visitors to England. Welcome to Scotland with its breeze locks and Robbie Burns. Welcome to England with its Hamlet's taverns and Sheila Delaney. <laughs> Come to bonny Scotland and see them tossing the caber. Come to peaceful England and watch them coshing the wages, Clark. <laughs> Excuse me, can I come into Scotland? Come along in, laddie. Come along in. Right, well, hang on while I wipe my feet. I don't want to dirty your heather. <laughs> Here, aren't you cold like that? Oh, you, you mean the kilt? Aye, oh, put it on. <laughs> so this is Scotland, is it? How much is it to come in? Ah, oh, bless you, laddie. Admission's free. You've been listening to too many tales about we Scots, you know. <laughs> I suppose I have, yeah. Tell me, uh, would you care to buy uh, a raffle ticket? Oh, it didn't take you long, did it? How much? One and um, ten bob. What's the first prize? Five Robinson's hat. <laughs> ah, well, I'm on my holidays. Go on, I'll have one. Where did you wish to go, laddie? In the cocky leaky. What did you say? In the cocky leaky. Don't you ever say that to me again, laddie. Well, what have I said? Put me down. Ah, look here, look here, you. There's only one way to pacify me now. Buy the rest of these raffle tickets. All right, I'll buy the rest of your flipping raffle tickets. Ah, well, uh, where are you going to, laddie? I'm going to a place called Inverco... Oh, no, never mind. I'll be skint before I get there. I'll find it myself. Hi-ho, Silva! <laughs> I should worry. I've got half of his holiday money here. <sighs> Hi. So, so this is Invercocky Leaky, is it? I wonder where the hotel is. Good evening, sir. Who? We spoke this morning on the telephone. My name's Laurie, remember? Oh, yes. You, st you spoke to me all the way from Scotland. You must be one of those long-distance lorries. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we go straight to the hotel, sir? It's on the other side of yon island. It's a beautiful little island. We, we love it. We are not like rich city dwellers with our dreams of riches and personal gain caught up in a everlasting battle of greed and lust for money, no? We are richer than most. Oh, I feel awful now, you know. I mean, you know, I mean, money doesn't mean a thing when you put it like that, does it? Is there any ferry to... Well, all Jock will row us across. A kindly old man of these parts who's been rowing folk to the island for many, many ah, years. Where is he now? Who? Old Jock. Good evening, sir. You? I step into the boat. That'll be five bob, please. Five bob? I thought you were supposed to be one of those simple people. It isn't for myself. You understand. 
Oh, so that's the Holiday Island, is it? The what? Oh, aye, 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 the Holiday Island, yes, that's it. What's it called? Dead Man's Rock. <laughs> Dead Man's Rock? It sounds like a new dance. I've changed my mind. I'll go to Blackpool instead. Wait, wait, until we get into Hangman's Creek, you'll be able to see the hotel. It's got illuminations just like Blackpool, man. There it is. Is that it? Uh, I'll say it's got illuminations. It's a flaming lighthouse. <laughs> Come along now, step ashore. Listen, if you think I'm going to spend a holiday with you locked up in that seagull's lamppost, you've got another thing coming. I'm going back home. Oh, oh dear me, look. The boat has drifted away. You let go of the rope. For your own good. The sea's very rough now. It isn't for myself. You understand. Now listen here, Barnacle Butlin. Welcome to the Beacon Hotel. Step inside. Here we are. And I hope you enjoy your holiday. Oh, I'm sure I will. I'll be able to send some smashing postcards home from here. Dear Auntie Nelly, having a wonderful time. I've been trimming the wick all week. <laughs> Where's this never-ending round of fun and games I read about in the guidebook? The what? Oh, aye. Plenty of fun and games. Just a minute now. No. Which hand is the button in? <laughs> Which hand is the button in? What about the dancing twice nightly? Ah, uh -huh. just a moment. <laughs> May I? Of course. It's a lovely band. Do you come here often? Only when I'm out of my mind. Let go! <laughs> Listen, I want a drink. Oh, at the Continental Bar. Oh, this should be good. Where's the Continental Bar? Right behind you. What, that? A bottle of brown ale standing next to a photo of de Gaulle? Well, what do you expect? <laughs> what do you expect for five and a half guineas all in? You'll get no five and a half guineas off me. I won't be here for a week. A week? It's five and a half guineas a day. We have a very complicated defence plan to pay for, you know. It isn't for myself. You understand. I understand. But listen, <laughs> let's have that bottle of brown ale. Certainly. Here you are. That'll be one and six, please. I've only got one and four. You'll be tuppence, then. That's it. That's it. That's the one that did it right. Well, I'm off. I'm going back to England. Hey, hey, hey. There's no boat. I'll swim for it. You'll get soaked. I've been getting soaked ever since I came here. Cheerio. <laughs> it wasn't for myself. You understand. Welcome to Bonnie Scotland with its locks, breeze, glens. You can wrap that lot up. Listen, come on, open the door. I'm going back to England. Oh, just a minute, sir, just a minute. Have you got a raffle ticket number 868? Let me see. Yes, I have. Why, laddie, this is great. You won the first prize. Congratulations. First prize? <laughs> well, sure, it's about time I had a bit of luck. Yes, you're a very lucky man. You have won a three-week holiday at the Beacon Hotel. Yes. <laughs> and the manager here is pissily waiting in his car. I will a claim and will we? No, I couldn't stand three more weeks of you. Get in the car. No, listen. No. No, I want to go back to England. No. No. I does it for myself. You understand? Ken Dodd, appearing with him were John Laurie, Cardio Robinson, Harold Behrens, The Springfields, and Judith Chalmers. The script was written by Eddie Braben and Ken Dodd, and the BBC Review Orchestra was conducted by Malcolm Lockyer. The Ken Dodd Show was produced by Eric Miller. <laughs> It's every man, woman, and child for himself because it's the Ken Dodd Show. And here he is, the nut from Naughty Ash, Ken Dodd. Thank you. 
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure here this evening. And now, and now, I will swallow my other brother. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And now, I will swallow this man. Don't bother to remove your haversack, sir. <laughs> By Jove, everybody's taking those pills, aren't they? <laughs> Get that ship out of here! <laughs> Thank you. Well, if you don't mind very much, I'd like to say a few words to me public. <laughs> me public, ladies and gentlemen and ditty people. I would like to say how highly honoured I am to be welcomed here today like a VIP. I've just been elected a VIP, Mrs. The Village Idiot's President. <laughs> I say you're there. Yes? Which is the best way to bury St. Edmund? Dig a big hole and shove him in. Really? I think I'll have a word with all the motorists who are listening on their car radios. Calling all motorists. Are you there? If you are plagued with punctures, see your doctor at once. <laughs> what shall I do next? I know. I'll knock on this woman's door and run away. What do you want? Oh, um, did you know that Salisbury, spelt backwards, is why rub Silas? How dare you take that? Ow! Oh. Just one moment, lad. Mind the moggy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Who are you? My name is Wee Johnny Laurie, much loved and respected Scottish actor of many years standing. Are you any good? I'm very articulate. Oh, you must be one of those articulated lorries. <laughs> <laughs> what sort of acting can you do? Anything. Pantomime? Try me. Make a noise like a pumpkin. Easy. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> you have won a tin of leg polish and a lightning tour of Broadcasting House. Lovely. Right. Well, here, you go through here. You can get changed through this door here. Right. <laughs> By Jove. Leo loves a bit of Scotch beef now and again. Well, what do you know? Did you know that the 1st Battalion of the King's Own Macaroons is the only regiment allowed to march through the streets of Dundee with their kilts on upside down? Well, what do you know? Housewives, take the drudgery out of housework with Cheerio. The next time your kitchen sink is piled with dirty, greasy dishes and your husband comes home to you with his socks full of holes, say... Cheerio! <laughs> well, what do you know? Here is a recording of a lighthouse keeper falling out of bed. Ow! Oh, oh, oh! Oh, oh, oh! Oh, oh, oh! <laughs> Door open. Well, what do you know? And the next question is from... David Evans. Mr. Chairman, I am unemployed and I have 18 children. Don't you think I should get some help from the government? You don't need any help. Well done. <laughs> dear, dear. A lot of people. Pardon? My dear boy. Mind the moggy. <laughs> ah, I'm so enjoying being in this program with you, dear, dear boy. John, my old friend, it's wonderful to see a man like you at 87 and still performing. <laughs> I've got a very pleasant surprise for you, dear boy. It gives me the greatest possible pleasure to present to you, on behalf of the Professional Entertainers Association, this gold medal, dear boy. Thank you, John. And by a very strange coincidence, it also gives me very great pleasure to present to you this gold plaque on behalf of the Amalgamated Actors Association. Wonderful. How did you know I was amalgamated? I saw you running for the bus earlier. <laughs> Uh -huh. I'm indeed honoured, as I'm sure you'll be when I hand you this silver trophy and plinth on behalf of the BBC. Right, thank you. Well, would you in turn accept from me this citation in gilt on velvet awarded by the Bootle Young Farmers Association? I will, and will you by the same token allow me to invest you with this magnificent tin cup, which I hand to you on behalf of the Outer Hebrides Opera Company? Why not? Why not? And it's my hope that you will accept just as graciously this superb set of matching squeaking cushions on behalf of the Huddersfield Camel Breeders Association. <laughs> of course I'll accept it graciously. I'm not an imbecile. Well, accept it then. And will you accept from me this perfect left hook to the chin? Ooh, and you this clenched fist in your left ear hole. Oh, oh, you dickhead. Oh, 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 oh. For our 
our visitors from overseas is the pageantry and colour to be found in our many traditional ceremonies. Not least of these is the ceremony of the keys held every day at this time in the courtyard of Naughty Ash Castle. So over now to Naughty Ash Castle for the handing over of the keys. Halt! Have ye the keys? I, I have the have a, have I? Um, oh, about turn, quick march. <laughs> Halt! I, we have the keys. <laughs> Open ye the west gate. I, um, yeah. Okay, I shall open ye west gate, I hope. Have ye the key? I've got the wrong bunch. <laughs> we'll come in through ye west window, left turn, quick march. We can now offer another really great attraction, not only for tourists, but for just about everybody tuned in now. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Jerry and the Pacemakers. <laughs> ever been in bed trying to get off to sleep when the people in the house opposite come to the front door to say good night to their visitors after a party good night tom good night george good night tom good night winnie good night george good night bill good night bill good night winnie good night bill good night tom good night george hello good night good night good night good night all good night them good night tom good night bill See you in the morning, George. <laughs> Good night. Good night, George. Good night. Good night, Winnie. Good night, Tom. Good night, Bill. Good night, Tom. Good night, then. Good night, 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 Come along now. What's all this noise about? Well, we were just saying good night, Constable. Oh, we've had enough good nights for one night. Now move on. Oh, yes. Thank you, then. Good night, Constable. Good night, Tom. Good night, Winnie. Good night, Constable. Good night, then. Good night, Tom. Welcome to Pet's Corner. Charles. No, I'm... It's not that kind of Pet's Corner. <laughs> anyway, put that woman down, Charlie. You haven't got enough green stamps. <laughs> <laughs> no, I meant four-footed pets. Like this little chap I've brought along with me. Ah, look at that. I can just see him all excited and wagging his tail. Come on, boy. Come on. Here, boy. Here, come on. <laughs> there he is. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Aubrey. Aubrey the pig. <laughs> down, boy. Down, boy. He knows I've got a bucket of swill for him in my pocket. <laughs> Aubrey's a very unusual pig, aren't you, Aubrey? Yes, Ben. Hey, oh, no, do you hear that, missus? Because <laughs> he's a talking pig. He's what you call a budgery pig. <laughs> Isn't that right, Aubrey? Yeah, that's right, Ben. <laughs> hey, he's a clever lad. Now then, stop showing up, Aubrey. Put that trumpet down. <laughs> oh, Joe, I must say, you're looking very spruce. Have you got a date tonight with a lady pig? <laughs> <laughs> you have, haven't you? Yeah. Aubrey, what's she like? Oh, a lovely bit of craggling. <laughs> <laughs> Sit. What is all this noise? I, uh, good heavens. A pig. A pig in broadcasting house. Out. Well, he's not doing any harm. Out. Why, well, let me go again. Yes, it isn't part of our present policy to permit performing pigs to postulate in the precincts. He wouldn't postulate in anybody's precincts, would he? <laughs> Out. Well, if he goes, I go. Hooray. Well, I'll go again. Oh, I should think so. And the next time you want to bring your relatives here, Dodd, you get permission first. I have never known... <laughs> Hello, Roderick. What's all this now? This is Roderick, the duck. 
Well, I mean, I couldn't leave him in the house on his own, could I? I mean, and these days, it's very difficult to find a duck sitter. <laughs> You'd make a very good duck sitter. You've got the figure for it. Get it out. <laughs> do, 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 no, look, he's picking my nose. Say, it could be worse. <laughs> yes? What? What's wrong? What's wrong? Two of your goats are in the woman's R studio eating the script. I don't believe it. Even a goat couldn't swallow that lot. <laughs> look, 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 get these things out of here. Well, Aubrey's the only one who can do it, and you've chased him. Well, all right, go on, bring him back. <laughs> Aubrey, Aubrey, where are Ah, oh, there you are. Aubrey, will you go and tell all your mates it's time to go home now? All right, then. <laughs> go on, Aubrey. That's it. That's it. Hear them up. Move them out. <laughs> what a smashing little pig he is. Look at him, chasing all the animals out. Yes. There you are. Now, there, see? He's got them all out now. I think you'd better apologise to Aubrey. Yes. Yes, well, uh, uh, Piggy, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, that won't do. You've got to do it properly. Go on, you know what little pig's like. <laughs> you, 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 you don't, you don't, you don't yes, mean... Yes, I do mean. Sit him on your knee. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't. Oh, of course you can. That's it now. Go on, do it. Now, oh. take hold of his little trotter and say it. Oh, very well. <laughs> this little piggy went to market. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, Aubrey. Now, Maestro Dodd presents the all-time hit parade, the greatest songs in the world, songs that will live forever. Unforgettable song titles like this one. <laughs> that was the Teddy Bear's Picnic. <laughs> and how about this beautiful melody? Are the children asleep, dear? Yes, they're all asleep. Freddy, Joe, Harry, Tommy, Gordon, Douglas... Ronnie, Jenny, Rita, Alice, Maureen, Betty, Joan, and Gladys. I can't stop loving you. <laughs> Still. Ah. Uh... 
as every sports fan knows, it's the anniversary of Britain's worst ever runner, Miles Behind. <laughs> he came last in the three A's final, lost in the European Games, and he crowned a shocking career at the Olympic Games by collapsing before the race started. <laughs> which only goes to prove that. You can't win them all, in which Ken Dodd pays tribute not to the greatest ever, but the worst ever. Men who could never win, like Police Constable Doddlethorpe. Um, you tree lane, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, you tree lane. Now, yes, you tree lane, sir. Yes, it's straight down, and it's the first on the... Uh, no, no, I'm a liar. <laughs> I'm a liar. It's the second. Yes, it's the second on the right, sir. Ah, thank you, Constable. Not at all, sir. <clears throat> Not at all, sir. That's it, sir. Yes, that's it. Straight down, sir. And it's the second on the... <laughs> no, the first on the right. <laughs> that's it. It's the first. Terrible failure number two. Mr. Doddington, the worst surgeon ever to set foot inside an operating theatre. Um, yes, well, uh, how, uh, how, how do you, uh, how do you uh, feel, Mr. MacDougall? Not very well at all, sir. I can't understand it. Yes, well, yeah. well you see, when I... Uh... When I, uh, t t when I t t took your appendix out this morning, I, uh, I checked up after the operation and, uh, well, uh, uh, I'm afraid we're missing one uh, t t transistor radio set. What do you mean that... Well, uh, open your pyjama jacket. Oh. Uh, that's, well, I'll just, uh, t I'll just uh, tap your chest, so... It's nine o'clock and time for Housewives <laughs> Choice. <laughs> And now meet terrible failure number three, Dodini, the world's worst trapeze artist. <laughs> Which brings us to the true story of the world's worst scientist. I am he. Kenneth, I am he. It all... Thank you, sir. <laughs> Keep it up. It's you and me against them. <laughs> I am he. Kenneth, I am he. It all started one night when I was on my way home from a birthday party given for Professor Hines. He was 57. <laughs> <laughs> I purchased an evening paper and I read directly below the government surplus offer of 6,000 pearls of Wren's officer's bloomers. <laughs> I read, wanted young man as assistant to one of the world's leading scientists. I hurried to the address and knocked at the door. Who's there? A friend. Prove it. How? Slide money underneath the door. <laughs> Will you take a check? I've got nothing against foreigners. Come in. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Professor Mac... What can I turn you into? Is I've he... come in answer to this advertisement. Let me see. 6,000 pairs of Wren officers, bloomers. No, not that one. Underneath, the one asking for an assistant. Oh, you'd like a job, would you? Yes, please. Tell me something about yourself. Well, lately, I've been working as a corkscrew model. I've got a nose for that sort of thing. <laughs> hmm. Before that, I was the chief test pilot in an Ettles cake factory. <laughs> as regards to my family life, I'm an only child, and so are my two brothers. <laughs> What a refreshing change to meet a man of your intelligence after being with clever people. <coughs> First, you must pass an intelligence test. Fire away. What is the square root of a triangle? One and nine pence halfpenny. <laughs> what a brain. The job's yours. What about wages? Thank you, that's very kind of you. <laughs> As you probably know, I'm engaged on space research. In that case, you'll doubtless be interested to learn that I have found a way to counteract weightlessness. How? I've just swallowed a cannonball. <laughs> Congratulations! Don't pat me on the back. Have you any other inventions of note to your credit? Certainly. I was the one who invented collapsible rhubarb. For all the good that did us. <laughs> <laughs> I invented coloured fluff, wrinkle-proof tripe, and the very popular stomach brush. Stomach brush? I've never heard of a stomach brush. Obviously, you don't eat biscuits in bed. <laughs> very handy. <laughs> now, now, what do you... What do you... What do you think? What do you think of this? What is it? It's a... It's an everlasting mothball. <laughs> I'll have to let it go. Oh! Down 
if you've won a Bunsen burner. Tom Butchley, let's get down to some serious scientific work. Very well. I'd like to tell you something of the work that... Great balls of haggis. <laughs> what is it? Look, up there in the sky, a sort of cone-shaped object. Where? That's the wart on the end of your nose. <laughs> Fortunately, I just happen to have with me one of my latest inventions, a wart remover. Is it any good? We'll soon find out. Turn your head sideways. <laughs> oh! Clean as a whistle. Thank you very much indeed. Does that mean I can have the job as your assistant? But you know nothing about space research. No, just come outside, Professor. I'd like to show you something. There. Now then, what do you think of that? Great basins of porridge. A space rocket. Precisely. Step inside, Professor. Oh, where are we going? To the planet Mars. Blast off. <laughs> so there you are, tatty by Earth. <laughs> so I know nothing about space research, eh, Professor? Welcome to the planet Mars. What a strange and wonderful planet. Look at that tower-like structure. That, Professor, is the nerve center of the planet Mars. How do you know all this? Because for some time now, Earth has been peopled by Martians. You don't mean... Of course I do. The black and white minstrels, they're all Martians. <laughs> Come on, we'll enter the tower by this door here. Follow me. <laughs> what a magnificent building. Do you see that control panel over mm. there? Just look at all those knobs and levers. Quick, get down. There's a Martian coming. Oh, what's he doing? He's going over to the control panel. He's going to blow up the Earth. He's pressing the knobs. Ah! We're in the tower hall of a black bull. You and your Mars. Well, we all make mistakes. I should have had more sense. May I have this dance? I'm going. Mind the mogging. I say you then. Yes? Which is the best way to bang her? Hit her with a bucket. Charming. Just survived the Ken Dutch show. Also taking part in the assault, you have John Murray, Cassie Edward, Ray Pell, Wally Seaton, Jerry of the Pacemakers, and Julian Chalmers. The BBC Review Orchestra, leader Julian Dyer, conductor Malcolm Lockyer. The script was written by Eddie Braben and Ken Dodd, and the show, which was recorded, was produced by Bill Wesley. <laughs> got in his head, the man you've all been waiting to meet, Wally Gooley. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Wally Gooley fans. It gives me great pleasure to be standing here in me singlet. Control yourselves. Let's do something for the Ditty people. Let's give the little man what he wants, little women. It gives me great pleasure now to present our tableau of the seasons. First, Miss Daphne Pratt, wearing nothing but flowers and representing the spirit of summer. Thank you, Daphne. Next, Miss Nellie Crump, wearing nothing but leaves and representing the spirit of autumn. And now, the one you've all been waiting for, me, wearing me dad's overcoat and representing the spirit of idleness. Stop this cheering, it's most embarrassing. 
Stop trying to embrace me, madam. There were others here long before you. <laughs> right. Well, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say how tickled I am. <clears throat> <laughs> highly honoured I am to have been told by the BBC that I'm the one they're going to give it to. Yes, I'm definitely going to get it. I haven't asked for it, but they say I have been and they're going to give it to me when I least expect it. <clears throat> It'll make me very proud. It'll probably fill me full of pomp. <laughs> very probably. <laughs> Before we go any further, I know a lot of you are waiting for me to give you the answers to last week's questions. So here they are. The answer to question number one, Gary Baldy. Gary Baldy invented the wig. <laughs> I say, you there. Yes? Which is the best way to wear them in Dorset? The same way as they wear them anywhere else. <laughs> I might have known. It's amazing the people you meet, isn't it? Oh, there's that cinema over the road. The one that shows all them continental films. Hey, look at all the men coming out with their heads down, trying to pretend they haven't been. <laughs> you ought to be ashamed of yourselves. <laughs> have you got nothing better to do with your money? I'll have one in the front circle, please. There'll be three in nine, please. What's the main feature? Uh, the naked jungle. Oh, don't fancy that. Monkeys with no clothes on. <laughs> I know. I'll go over to that police constable and pretend to be a foreigner. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Constable. Yes, sir. Now what's the trouble? Oh, there's no trouble, Constable. You see, it's just that I'm a foreigner, you see. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm from, um, from uh, Yugoslavia, you see. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't speak a word of English, you see. Oh, I see, sir. And uh, what exactly is it you want to know? Pardon? Uh, oh, I'm so sorry, sir. I forgot you were a foreigner. <clears throat> what is it that vu, that vu uh, want to know? Well, I'm hungry, you see, Constable, and I want to go into that cafe over there mm. and order a plate of egg, chips, sausages and tomatoes with two rounds of bread and a cup of tea. But I don't know what it is in English, you see. It's very awkward. Well, no, that's quite simple, sir. Just go in and say, A plate... A plate? ...of eggy chippy... <laughs> eggy chippy? Tomatoes... Tomatoes? No, sir. Tomatoes with two rounds bready, cuppy of tea. Thank you very much, Constable. You've been frightfully helpful. Not at all, sir. Good day, sir. Tatty bye, Constable. What a smashing Constable. Oh, my bonny be laddie. Who are you? My name is wee Johnny Laurie, much loved and respected Scottish actor of many years standing. Just arrived on the Enver Cocky Leaky Express. You stand there with your little diddy Scottish legs. <laughs> sticking out of your kilt like two sticks of celery dangling through a hole in a carrier bag. <laughs> That you've come all the way down from Cocky Inverlicky Nocky. Inverlocky Nock. Oh, tut, tut, you've got me at it now. Inver Cocky Leaky. That wee paradise in the Highlands. Is it really, John? I man, it is. To live in Inver Cocky Leaky is to know the true meaning of happiness. Ah. <laughs> Outsiders come and they, they laugh at us, simple folk, but we pity them. We know in our hearts that we are far richer in many ways. Ah. And as the visitors leave us to return to the big cities, we feel more than sorry for them. Why do you feel sorry for them, John? Because we have robbed them soft and they have to walk home. <laughs> well, what do you know? Did you know that when an Eskimo eats a whale, he puts on 987 stone? <laughs> well, what do you know? Did you know that when the snow lies more than six inches deep in Germany, all the dash hounds go around on stilts? Well, what do you know? Do you know that if I don't shut up, Judith Chalmers will very likely clock me one? I wouldn't do that, Ken, but I would like you to step back and leave a space around the microphone for our guests this week, the Barry Sisters. <laughs>
yourself enthusiasts. This is your old pal, Willie Mendham. I'll not keep you a minute, I'm just emptying this bottle of paint remover into the wife's cocoa. <clears throat> Lovely. She'll, she'll sleep now. <clears throat> now, this week, I'm up in the attic having a look at my system. I'm having a good look round to see if anything wants lagging. <laughs> ah, here's a piece of rusty old piping that could do. Oh, it's me leg. <laughs> now, this is the time of the year when you should take a good look at your plumbing arrangements. If you do get a burst, you can repair it yourself with one of the many emergency kits you can buy now. It's like a big dollop of horrible looking stuff. <laughs> I got some last year and the the wife thought it was a dumpling and bunged it in the stew. <laughs> it was lying there on her plate, surrounded by carrots. As she raised it to her mouth to swallow it, I had the presence of mind to say nothing. <laughs> she was all right. She was fine when she came out of hospital. She was a very good vet. On with the job. If there's a funny rumble in your system, go and have a lie down for half an hour. <laughs> when you come to mend a burst, your best friend is your blow lamp. <laughs> I'll just get it going. Now, there we are, we're going to go in. Now, you don't need me to tell you that in the hands of a novice, a blow lamp can be a very, very dangerous thing. There's an art in using a blow lamp correctly, and I'm going to show you the correct way on this piece of pipe here. Well, now, first, you have to... First, you have to prepare, prepare the surface of the pipe, and... It's getting blinking hot up here. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. We're on fire. I'll show you how to make an escape ladder. First, you need a dirty, groping long rope and a couple of hooks. I know, let's do something now that should please all the mums. A drop of real-life romance. Charles. Norma. Charles. Norma. Charles. Norma. Arthur! Ah! Arthur. Norma. Arthur. Albert! Norma. Basil. Basil. Albert. You're a rotten shot, Basil. <laughs> the story that I have.
have to tell you now is a rather strange and terrifying one. This fellow frightens the life out of me. It concerns three witches. Oh, do you know, I can't stand witches. Funny thing, isn't it? When I was a little lad, I used to think my granny was a witch. <laughs> my granddad still does. <laughs> Allow me to unfold my tale. Really? You should be in a circus. <laughs> This, then, is the story of the three witches and the weary traveller. Who, who, who's the weary traveller? You are. I thought so. Right. Let's get it over with, then. Picture the scene. It's a dark and stormy night. Listen. <laughs> are we ready, sisters? Aye, we're ready. We've much work to do. Then let us be a bunch of squirrels! Man's <laughs> blood! <laughs> Spiders! Naked! <laughs> Horrible horror! Chickens' lips! <laughs> Rats' tails! <laughs> and rats <laughs> Yucky juice! <laughs> Horrible horror! Worms and gizzards! <laughs> I'm not going in that cafe. <laughs> Oh, I should think not. I'll have a jam butty at home. <laughs> it didn't frighten me, though. No. No, because actually... <laughs> no, because actually I'm a bit of a witch. You are not. I'll show you whether I'm a witch or not. I'll put a spell on you. Do you mind if I have a scoff? <coughs> scoff? <coughs> scoff? You'll scoff the other side of your face in a minute. <laughs> you just wait till I get me cauldron going. Come on. All right, here we go, then. <laughs> now, then, it's bubbling nicely. Now, where's my little book of spells? Here it is. Now, how to make spells and influence people. Yes, this is the one. All right, here we go. <clears throat> right. The ear of a wig. A toad with no toes. All the steam's going up me nose. <laughs> Add coal and wood, and soon the heat'll turn Johnny Lorry into a beetle. <laughs> well, uh, I've never heard anything so... Oh, oh. Oh, if there's anything that you want, if there's anything I want... Good afternoon. This week's edition of Down Your Way comes from the delightful village of Notty Ash. I'm speaking to you from the yard of a very old and well-known local firm of craftsmen, McDoddy and Son, and I have with me the son of the owner, Mr. Kenneth McDoddy. Good afternoon, Mr. McDoddy. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you, can you tell me what it is you're doing now? Yes, yes. I call this pro process putting me overalls on. Oh. <laughs> Now, this is, this is something that I have to do every day. It's called knocking. Ah, and uh, why do you have to do it? So they'll open the door. You're late. Ah, oh, shut up. I'm from the BBC. We have no jobs. He's doing down your thingy with a mobile unit. <laughs> we better not try. I, I only want to talk to you about your work here and ask you to choose a record. Eh? Oh, was he? Ah, now, that looks most interesting. Uh, can you explain it for our listeners? Certainly. This is called gripping. Gripping? And what are you gripping? Oh, Norma. <laughs> uh, excuse me, but uh, what do you make here? Yeah, Tea? Cocoa? What would you like? Oh, I see what you mean, yes. Well, uh, here we make... Um, <clears throat> and I believe that we're the only people in the country making them now. Hundreds every day. Hundreds of what? Doorknobs. Doorknobs? Yes, this is a doorknobbery. We make all sorts of doorknobs. And uh, like all the old crafts, I suppose that there's a shortage of doorknob men. Who? Doorknob men. Doorknob men? Where did you get that name from? Doorknobberists? <laughs> no, there's no shortage of men. Oh, jolly good. Well, it's been most interesting talking to you, Mr. McDoddy, and to close this week's edition of Down Your Way, uh, would you like us to play a record for you? Well, as I said before, there's no shortage of men in this trade, and we've left the choice of uh, a record to our youngest apprentice, Dougie. Come on, Dougie. Ah, hello, Dougie. <laughs> Uh, you stopped them very young here, don't you? Well, it's, uh, it's for his own good. He'll be on a pension when he's 11. Oh, I see. 
<laughs> now, Dougie, uh, which record would you like to hear? Oh, I, I, I would like to hear Ken Dodd singing still. <laughs> It's time for the spotlight to be turned on the world's worst. Those men who could never quite make it. Men like Paddy O'Doddy, the world's worst Irish folk singer. Charles Bach and Mary we are a <laughs> Now meet Dodd Latino, the world's worst lover. Darling. <laughs> and you lock a belt round the ear off. <laughs> Then there's fearless Captain Doddlefield, the worst ever lion tamer. I will now put my head into the lion's jaws. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Lauren Smythe upshot Dudley, the worst ever elocution teacher. What's to do with you? It's the girl with the fur her. Now make a bit of a shape, the lot of you. Which brings us to the incredible saga of the world's worst scientist, Professor McManiac and his hair-brained assistant. I'm not a hair-brained assistant. Useless, yes. This story that I'm going to tell you all started one night when I got back from the Rotary Club. I was feeling rather dizzy. And I put my blue boots on and went for a lie down. In the next room, Professor McManiac was trying out his latest invention. Oh, 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 I, oh, 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 oh. It was a... <laughs> it was a small kilt heater, and he'd obviously... <laughs> and he'd obviously put too much paraffin in. <laughs> Are you all right, Professor? Can I get you anything? Yes, get me a money for this. What's the news? My work is in jeopardy. That's a long way to have to travel every day. <laughs> Come in and we'll exchange notes. Oh, good idea. I'll give you this ten shilling note for your pound note. Done. Yes, I have been. This is a soap voucher. <laughs> Let's get down to business, Professor. What have you been working on this week? Oh, I have some drawings here that I'd like you to look at. Uh-huh, I say you can get locked up for this, Professor. You know that. <laughs> have you invented anything interesting? Yes, this tablet. Would you care to try it? Certainly. What does it do? It's an instant beard tablet. Oh, lovely. I, I've always wanted to be out. How long will it take to grow? Any second now. What a magnificent bush. I can't see it. That's because it's growing out of the back of your neck. You see, it's a back-to-front beard. When you walk into a room, people will say, Cheerio! Excellent work. And I'm glad to report that my experiment is still growing strong. Which one is that? I haven't slept for three years. You're kidding. I've never been more serious in my life. I haven't closed my eyes for three years, and I don't intend to do so for another three years. <laughs> Professor! Uh, what? You a wound? Oh, dear. My dear chap, what is it? I thought I was going to have one of my bouts. I've been falling over a lot this week. I think it's this iron hat I'm wearing. <laughs> and, uh... Ah, good evening. I'm Hickey. We all have our little problems. <laughs> Are you by any chance Professor Hickey? The same. I've heard about you. Aren't you trying out some unusual experiment? Yes, I'm trying to prove that a man can go without a bath for 15 years. I've gone nine years without one up to now. Go on, hop it! Get out of here! On your way, you mucky old scientist! <laughs> ah, such is the price of greatness. What a, what a strange man! 
Yes, the whole family's the same. I knew his sister, Jack Hickey. <laughs> well, now, Professor, it's time I showed you my invention for this week. Uh, what is it? A one-man submarine for three people. I sooner have my diving bell. Ah, you're too old-fashioned. You're an authority in oceanography. Didn't I invent the waterproof watch so you can see what time you're drowning at? Two, two. <laughs> Well, we're going down to the docks now to try out my one-man submarine for three people. I'll bring my diving bell. <laughs> and a lot of use that's going to be. To the docks! How oh, fascinating to the docks. Great locks full of whiskey. Ha, ha, ha! There's me submarine. What do you think of it? It's taken me 25 years to build that submarine. I beg your pardon? It's taken me seven years to build that submarine. How long? I bought it this morning. <laughs> I'll hop in, Professor. I'll see how low I can sink. You certainly couldn't sink much lower than you are, my dear chap. <laughs> Have you taken any safety measures? Yes, I've just eaten a cork pudding. <laughs> we can keep in touch with one another with this two-way telephone. Touchy bye, Professor. I'll, uh, I'll contact him over this telephone. I hope we don't have to put money in this thing. Hello, is that Seabed 1212? Who do you wish to speak to, please? My assistant. My assistant speaking. What do you want? <laughs> What's it like down there? I can't see a thing through the porthole. Why not? I forgot to put one in. <laughs> yes, I did. I did. No, I really did. I'm looking through the porthole now. Yeah. What is it? There's an horrible looking thing down here. You're telling me. <laughs> Are the bulkheads of your submarine standing up to terrific pressures down there at that depth of five feet six? Of course they are. This submarine is as safe as the bank. Mm. The bank's closing early today. Hold me up, quick! <laughs> My dear boy, for one horrible moment, I thought you weren't going to get soaked. Oh, Joe. I think you're right, Professor. Your diving bell would be better. Ooh, where is your diving bell? I've never even seen it. I'll show you. Norma! Professor. Norma. You crafty old inventor. Come back here with that wonderful invention. Mind the moggy. I say, you there. Yes? Which is the best way to crawl it? On your hands and knees, sir. Well, not all like you. Tatty bye, everybody. <laughs> Sit back and recover from the Ken Dodd Show, as will John Laurie, Percy Edwards, Peter Hudson, Wallace Eaton, the Barry Sisters, and Judith Chalmers. The BBC Review Orchestra, Nita Julian Guyard, conductor Malcolm Lockyer. The script was written by Eddie Braben and Ken Dodd, and the show, which was recorded, was produced by Bill Worsley. <laughs> Smollett fans. I only wish that Lady Smollett could be here with me, but she is at home washing the little Smollett. It gives me great pleasure to be standing here in my chamois leather singlet, glass Bermuda shorts, gold army bootlaces, and a sequin studded corn plaster. I will now blow up the leg of my trousers and inflate my shirt. <laughs> I will now release 35,000 pigeons from my trouser pocket. 
I will now write a letter to heavyweight boxer Sonny Liston. Sir, you are very ugly, and when I meet up with you, I'm going to give you a good hiding. Signed, Bill Worsley. I know you all love me, and if you keep going on with this cheering, I will come round and give each one of you a big kiss. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not all that mad on you either. <laughs> first of all, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to say how tickled I am, how highly honoured I am to have been chosen the beauty king of... <laughs> the beauty king of Battersea Dog Dome. <laughs> today, ladies and gentlemen, is a very nostalgic day for me because it's exactly 15 years ago today that I went out of my mind. And... <laughs> I remember it very well. It's as if it was 15 years ago because I remember this particular morning I woke up and I found myself writing poetry on the tail of my shirt. And <laughs> sometime later, sometime later, a little later, I was on my way to the paint shop for a new coat and there was this little man. There was this little man. He was sitting in a bowler hat. His little legs were dangling over the brim. He said, excuse me, but that's a lovely dog. I said, yes, we've had him ever since he was a wheelbarrow. He said, really? <laughs> Step inside this van. <laughs> I say, you there. Yes. Which is the best way to press tat in? Poke it with your finger. <laughs> <laughs> there was once an Irish chiropodist, and he said to me, your fate is in me hands. <laughs> is it? Is it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. My old friend. Oh, my body, we laddie. Semprini. <laughs> Give us a serenade. No, my, wee, my name is wee Johnny Laurie, much loved and respected Scottish actor of many years standing, and... Here he comes. The fourth laird of Enver Kokiliki. Is it official? I have been gazetted. You'd better sit down for a few minutes. <laughs> so that's why you're wearing that brand new kilt. It's the Laurie Tartan. The Laurie Tartan. Oh, yes, I can see the tire marks. <laughs> that must have been where you were gazetted. Well, what do you know? Did you know that if a bald-headed man puts a kipper under his hat and leaves it there for three months, he can get locked up? Well, what do you know? Did you know that there is a new sound emerging from Liverpool and being created by a new beat group known as the Dottles? Well, what do you know? If you wait here, for the next three minutes, you should learn quite a lot from our guests for this week. A group of young men who know more about the Liverpool sound than most. Who else but the Beatles? <laughs> She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. She loves you, yeah, 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 yeah. Hello, all you. Do-it-yourself enthusiasts. <laughs> this is your old do-it-yourself pal, Ivor Toolbox. Now, I'll not keep you just a minute. I just want to finish sandpaper in the wife's kneecaps. <laughs> there we are, lovey. You should be able to get your Wellingtons on now. <laughs> today, today, I'm going to show you how to make a medicine chest. Now, if you want to paint your chest, it's entirely up to you. I think I'll stain mine a dark oak. <laughs> <laughs> or walnut. It's very important to have a good first aid box in the home because you never know the minute. Only the other day, the wife's mother fell down the stairs from top to bottom and I said to the wife, I said, don't panic, don't panic. We'll see Cheyenne first and then go and have a look at her. <laughs> now let's get started, shall we? Now making this medicine chest fairly large because I want to put in plenty of the right sort of first aid equipment. I'm going to put in a, a little bottle of brandy. I think you'll agree that's very essential. Half a bottle of whiskey, a bottle of rum, a quart of gin, and a bottle of Advocat. I'd better leave some room in this corner for a bottle of aspirins. I'll probably need them after this lot. You must have the box in a handy place where you can get at it. I'm hanging this one behind the parlour door of the woman's house next door. Now, <laughs> now there we have the medicine chest firmly fixed, solid as a rock. Nothing will shift that now. I can pull it and push it as much as I like. I can. Ooh, ow, ooh, 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 ow, 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 ow,
I'll show you how to make a splint. First of all, you need some light wood. Two rounds of oil. We now go over to the famous vineyards of Knotty Ash for the annual wine tasting ceremony held at this time every year in the grounds of the Chateau Knotty Ash. The Burgomaster of Knotty Ash presides. Sample of barrel number one, the Knotty Ash Sherry. Sample of barrel number one, the Knotty Ash Sherry. Sample of barrel number two, Knotty Ash Sun Fame. Good health. Sample of barrel number two, Knotty Ash Sun Fame. Good health. That's an old bill by the stream. No, we must all pull ourselves together. That's an old bill by the stream. No, we must all pull ourselves together. Get that budgie out of here. Get that budgie out of here. Now then, now then, what's going on here? Now then, now then, what's going on here? <laughs> Right, all into the Black Mariah. Right, all into the Black Mariah. Carry on, driver. As you probably know, ladies and gentlemen, I'm a great lover of the outdoor life, the country lanes and open fields. I love a ramble, as you very likely noticed. <laughs> Early this morning, I was out walking when I met my old friend, Mr. Percy Edwards. Hello, Mr. Edwards. Hello, Ken. Try not making noise. Why, what is it? Over there in that bush. Who is? It's a pied... <laughs> it's a pied wagtail. And you see over there, Ken? What? That noisy old rook looking for his breakfast. <laughs> it's very good, you know, the way you can do all the different impressions of birds and animals. That's nice of you to say that, Ken. No, I mean, not many of us can do it, can they? You can do animal impressions, can't well, you? Well, you know, I, and I only do the very difficult ones. Uh. I mean, you're very good, Percy, but I don't think you could do the impressions that I do. Well, let me hear of you, because I'm always willing to learn. Well, uh, can you do the rude warbler? <laughs> I never heard of the rude warbler. Oh, yes, a very well-known bird, the rude warbler. It goes... <laughs> Have you ever heard of the coffinch? I can't say I have, Tim. What sort of noise does that one make? Well, the coffinch sits on the branch of a tree and goes... <coughs> <coughs> And then there's that very rare bird, the wahoo-hoo bird. The what bird? The wahoo-hoo bird. It sits on a barbed wire fence and goes, wahoo-hoo, ow. <laughs> oh, well, I, I can see that I've still got a lot to learn, Don't Ken. lose heart, Percy. You keep at it like I had to do. I do, Ken, bless you. That's why I'm out here this morning, because, you know, I'm trying to perfect the cry of a fox. A fox? Arrow! Right, Joe, that's good. Do it again. Go on. Arrow! See if you can get it louder, you know. Arrow! Oh, gracious me, I'm afraid I have got it right. Listen. Those hounds, they're coming this way. What do we do now, Mr. Edwards? What any good bird watch you do in our place? What's that? Run like mad and we're at it, mate. Hello! <laughs> Yesterdays. Time for Ken Dodd to take a look back and say... I didn't know I had that big hole in my trousers. <laughs> 1901. Europe watches as Mussolini declares war on Mrs. Mussolini. Take that, to Mama! Wild scenes in Glasgow as King McJock is crowned. Oh, my head. <laughs> 19 How's your father? And the Henley debutante of the year, Miss Henrietta de Knox, is elected regatta queen. Here you see her being regarded. <laughs> 19 30 thingy. And all Britain acclaims Captain Webb, the first man to swim up Snowden. <laughs> Trouble in America, and Hoover is put on the carpet. 19. Prince Albert is seen here at Euston Station. Carry your bags, sir. Here we see the tear-stained faces of loyal Welshmen outside Carnarvon Castle after hearing that Gladys Morgan has abdicated. <laughs> A rare film of the Greek Prime Minister, Harry Stottle. Seen here talking to the Prime Minister of Italy, Harry Widerci. <laughs> 
19, oh dear. And Europe watches as Mussolini gets a basin rammed over his head. Arrivederci! Where are you going? To the head doctor. Hang on, I'll come with you. Tati Maderci, everybody. <laughs> ever been to a circus, you've no doubt marvelled at the skill of the daring young men on the flying trapeze, as they catch one another by their fingertips. But have you ever wondered what they talk about during their performance? Hey, Alf. Yes, Annie? I'm taking Gladys out tonight after the show. Ali, hop! Gladys is my girl, Harry. <laughs> so what? I'm taking her out for a nosh and then back to the old caravan afterwards. <laughs> I love Gladys, Harry. Hello! You're too old fashioned, Alf. Hello! Hoop! No, it's not fair, Harry. Hello! Hoop! Get with it, Alf. I say love them and leave them. I'm not going to fall. Aren't you, Harry? <laughs> not this boy. Halle, hoop! Oh, 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 oh! Catch me! Ah! I love Gladys, Harry. <laughs> It's 12 noon on Sunday, and time once again for two-way family favourites. And today we hope to play as many records as possible for your loved ones serving overseas. Hello, Ken. Are you hearing me all right? Hello, Judith. Yes, I can hear you quite well where I am, serving overseas here in Naughty Ash with our British soldiers. <laughs> What's the weather like where you are? Yes, thank you, Judith. <laughs> What's the weather like? I'm serving here in Naughty Ash with our British soldiers, Judith. What's the weather? Oh, it doesn't matter. Uh, would you care to start our programme with the first record, Ken? Rainy like hell here, Judith. <laughs> Have you a record for us, Ken? What's the weather like where you are, Judith? Not very cheerful, I'm afraid. You what? It looks like rain. I'm serving overseas here in Naughty Ash, Judith, <laughs> with our British soldiers. Take care of yourselves. Have you got a record for us? Why, haven't you got any? <laughs> of course! Well, what do you want ours for, then? What's the weather like where you are, Judith? It's raining! What, in the studio? <laughs> I have a card here for Corporal Thompson, serving with B-A-O-R. He's not here. Post it to him, Judith. <laughs> Your wife, Maggie, and the four children send you all their love. And... I'm not married, Judith. <laughs> It's for Corporal Thompson. You what, Judith? This card is for Corporal Thompson. I'm serving here in Naughty House, Judith. For our British soldiers. Take care of yourselves. What the, what's the weather like, Judith? Never mind about the weather. It's getting worse here. Hello, Mrs. Tickleson of Featherstone. I have a request here from your husband, Ted Tickleson. Your wife would like us to play Corporal Thompson the 1812 Overture. <laughs> Mrs. Tickleson, chubby checker. Let's twist again like we did last summer. Come on, let's twist again. Let's give Hello, Judith. What's the weather like where you are? Take yours off. Pardon? Take yours off. Not likely. It's freezing. Huh? I think there's a storm coming up. Take care of yourselves. What's happening? Help! Hello? Hello? Hello, come in, Naughty Ash. Oh, well, I'm going to play a brand new song here, sung by Ken Dodd. I love you tenderly. I love you tenderly And I love you forever I'll kiss you gently and I will leave you never I'd give all I possess To make you mine I'll never let you go Till the end of time so please believe in me and love
love me in return But if you cannot give The love for which I yearn I'll go on wanting you Waiting patiently And should you come to me I love you tenderly So please believe in me And love me in return But if you cannot give The love for which I yearn Ages of man, Polly put the kettle on. The infant. Polly put the kettle on, 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 Polly The little boy. Hey, Polly, Polly, put the kettle on, will you, Polly? Hey, will you? Put the kettle on, Polly, will you? Hey, and then we'll all have tea, or I'll kick you. <laughs> the young man. Polly. <laughs> Come here, Polly. <laughs> Polly, there's something I want you to do for me. Put the kettle on for me, Polly. Of course I won't tell anybody. Put the kettle on, Polly. Oh, you've put the kettle on. Good. Now we can all have... Mm. The husband. Uh, Polly, lovey. <laughs> Would you like to put the kettle on, lovey dearies? Yeah, well... I only said put the kettle on. Yes, I'll put it on myself. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring you one up. Yes, all right. The middle-aged man. Polly, put that kettle on, will you? I'll be late for the match. <laughs> Polly, I'm talking to you. Polly, oh, my knees are burning here. <laughs> put the kettle on, Polly, will you? And then we'll, oh, you've made it, have you? Oh, chocolate biscuits. Oh, thanks. Thanks very much, Gladys. It's a good job Polly isn't here, isn't it? <laughs> The old man. Polly, get the puddle on. <laughs> kettle, put the puddle on. <laughs> put the kettle on, you, uh, what's your name? And, uh, madam, and we'll all have a pot of, uh, uh, cocoa. <laughs> Did he get my ginger nuts, madam? The old, old man of a hundred, his race is run. He only has one thought. Oh, Polly, put the kettle on, Polly. Oh, Polly, oh, Polly, put the kettle on and we'll all have more. Oh, go, go. The next couple of minutes might prove rather dangerous because once again we invite you to meet the world's worst. Men who could never do a thing right. Men like Adrian Doddridge, the world's worst stamp collector. Any regs? <laughs> Now meet Mr. Dodlop, the worst ever dentist. Yeah, uh, I think you'd better just as well take the lot out for me, Mr. Dodlop. Very well, Mr. Mac. <laughs> Next. Meet Dr. Dodds, the world's worst doctor. Uh, about those pills you gave me last week, doctor. Yes, Mrs. Smith. <laughs> And here comes Mr. Doddingley, the worst ever food inspector. Hey, Joe, those green sausages look nice. <laughs> and how about Joe Doddsley, the world's worst lifeguard? No! Help! No! I can't swim! 
Neither can I. I'm going under. Cheerio. <laughs> Which brings us to episode six in the still incredible adventures of Professor MacManiac and his useless assistant. I am the useless assistant. My story this week began one night as I lay in the bath. I wanted to see what my tattoo looked like underwater. <laughs> as well as to check to see if my legs were still waterproof. I climbed out of the bath, and as I couldn't find the towel, I had a roll on the fitted carpet in the hall. This greatly amused the man who was reading the gas meter. He gave me a 15 shillings rebate. I had just finished dressing when my colleague, Professor McManiac, burst into the room. Oh, I'm always doing that lately. That's the fourth balloon this week. I feel quite weak. Can I get you anything? No, thank you. Just let me hold your wallet for a few weeks. I'm old and feeble. Yes. I'm no use to anyone anymore. No. I'm more of a hindrance than a help now. Yes. You're not much of a comfort, are you? No. I might as well go to my room. I'm old and tired. Good night. Professor. Norma. Hey, I thought you were supposed to be old and tired. I'm so sorry. Why can't you take snuff like all the other old cocks? <laughs> Let's get down to business. Uh, where are we off to with our scientific invention? Well, I sent one of my inventions to the Admiralty, but they said they couldn't see much demand for an iron life belt. <laughs> Imbeciles! And that other invention of mine, the one that would have solved all the traffic problems in this country. No use at all. Why ever not? It exploded before Mr. Martles opened it. <laughs> what a terrible waste. Do you know that little tortoise of mine? Yes, you mean Barney tortoise. That's him. Well, this morning, I fitted an engine to his back and sent him off at the M1. <laughs> I should have seen him go. <laughs> he got pulled up for speeding. <laughs> you can only see his shell. He looks super. <laughs> Anything else? I've invented this early warning system. It gives me four minutes to get out of the house before the rent man calls. <laughs> oh, and a letter came for you this morning marked private and personal. Oh, thank you. And naturally, being a man of some principle, I steamed it open before you got here. <laughs> Good man. Have an OBE. No, thank you. They turn me singlet. <laughs> What's in the letter, Professor? You've got a horrible white. Great boxes of crumbucks. I'm a father. Congratulations. When did this happen? Thirty years ago. <laughs> I must sit down. The shock has been too much for me. What are we working on? This machine that I've just built. You just press a button and it undresses you. Oh, may I try it? Step inside and close the door. Are you ready to be automatically undressed? I can't see a thing in here. I'm starting the machine now. <laughs> Keep still, you silly old man. I'll tear your shirt. <laughs> oh, get your hands off me, woman. How dare you? Oh. What, what's to do? That was a stupid contraption if ever I saw one. Well, she couldn't see anything. She had a blindfold in her pocket. <laughs> Put your shirt back on and let's go. Go where? Go where? Go up in the clouds, Professor. Up in the air in me hot air balloon. It's full of puff. Come out, son. Have a look at it. There you are. Great kilts full of thistles. Look at that little basket. Pardon? <laughs> Well, that's where we sit, you see. <laughs> that's where we sit. Come on, climb in. Oh, this excitement isn't good for me. I, I've just become a father. Well, swallow this get well soon card. <laughs> that was 30 years ago, Professor. Come on, let's go. Chuck out the ballast, throw out the excess baggage. Professor. No, my, oh, what a waste. Ha-ha! Hee-hee! Ha-ha! It's smashing up here! I want to get out! You can't! We're 2,000 feet up! Don't jump! You'll ruin your sparring! Oh! It's... It's a time like this when I wish I was back in my little cottage! Ha-ha! I say! Look at the birds! Yes. Look at them pigeons! Let's get our own back with these bricks! My dear little cottage. My cottage with a little pathway down through the rose garden. Leading to the little lily pond by the potting shed in the corner. How do you know about the lily pond? I don't know. But if you know about the lily pond, yes, you you must be... Oh, no. My son, give your daddy a kiss. <laughs> Where are you going? Not likely. Back, back, my son, come back. Tatty, bye, daddy. I say, are you there? Yes. Is this the way to Bath? No, you have to get undressed first. Ah, oh, fine, man. Tati, bye, everybody! It must have been the Kendall 
show The Place is in Ruins. Also taking part, you heard John Laurie, Percy Edwards, Wallace Eaton, Peter Hudson, The Beatles and Judith Chalmers. With the BBC Variety Orchestra, leader John Jezzard, conductor Paul Fenneray. The script was written by Eddie Braben and Ken Dodd, and the show which was recorded was produced by Bill Wesley. <laughs>